The Languedoc Roussillon region of France is one of the most evocative destinations in the world. And for me, it was love at first sight. I now call the beautiful medieval town of Uzes my home for many months of the year. What better way to share it than with a week-long movable feast? I call those who join me on my guided culinary adventures my gastronomers. And the south of France is a land of incredible flavours and atmosphere. So come with me. I'm Peter Mathias and this is my culinary adventure in the south of France. of France's Languedoc Roussillon are one of the region's most defining features. Stretching from the Rhone River in the east to the Pyrenees Mountains and Spain in the west, this area produces around a third of France's wine. The Languedoc region is the biggest vineyard in the whole world. We're here in the Ero Valley, which is carpeted with vineyards. The conditions here are absolutely sublime for growing wine because you've got the sea, you've got strong, healthy winds, you've got endless sunshine, and you've got a variety of terroir all in the same area. Of course, people have been growing grapes here for over 2,000 years. But what is interesting is that what's starting to happen now is many winemakers are adopting new world wine practices. So you've got very old land, but very contemporary ideas. So in this episode, I meet some southern French vintners. It's that time of year for these little French delicacies, too. And my gastro nomads make the most of the luscious summer produce. Here in the Eiffel Valley, mechanical pickers do the work of many hands. Post-World War II, this land became mass production wine country, with thousands of grape growers joining cooperatives. The Languedoc Roussillon was the biggest contributor to the European wine lake of the 1970s and 80s. Most of it, Le Gros Rouge, cheap red plonk. This vineyard and many others have been changing both the physical and commercial landscape, pulling up the ordinary old Languedoc vines and replanting with proven winners. With its large and modern winery, Le Domaine Paul Mas has found the road to continued success. Today's business is the latest chapter in the continuing story of the Maas family, who planted their first Ero Valley vines in 1892. It's fabulous to be in a winery at this time of year. It's all go and the smell of all that grape juice is very sexy and intoxicating. Yeah, they watch it like a hawk. You know, they, they practically polish the grapes like little babies. And this is a huge vineyard. The care that's taken is amazing. The vast majority of Languedoc wines have historically yeah. been produced by wine cooperatives using high-yielding grape varieties. The resulting thin wines were often blended with red wine from North Africa to give them more body. Not so here. These vats hold nothing but luscious Syrah from the vineyard. He says um, that a good grape, if it tastes good and he knows what tastes good, will always be a good wine and that the expression um, a good wine is made in the vineyard is absolutely true. Le Domaine Paul Mas is at the forefront of challenging the old wine cooperative approach with what they call old world wine with a new world attitude. And with Chateau Paul Mas providing an extravagant background, I'm going to sample the stable of wines, making it big in over 40 markets around the globe. Wow. Arrogant Frog, wine New World buyers with tongue-in-cheek labels and quirky names. Fourth-generation winemaker Jean-Claude Mas says his philosophy is about true luxury being accessible luxury. And my, my real goal is when someone tastes a glass of wine, no matter what the price is, is to say, oof, that's good. Just that, you know, this first impression, oof, that's good. Uh, even my father, there was all his life in the vineyard, he was a farmer. Even him, he was understanding that the more he would produce, 
the more you will make money and yes. the more you will satisfy these consumers that were drinking yes. five liters per, per day. I they didn't want it 14% alcohol. Five liters a day. And that was a different world. Today, yes. my wines are for people that would do a glass for lunch. Or but they're also dinner. very accessible. Luxury is not a, to have the, the best car, the best watch, is the best. It's to have things that really give you the real emotion. And mm. I think that, I think that the new age, probably, it's a new age luxury. And I think I want to be part of that with my wine. Mm. The vineyards of the Languedoc extend all the way inland to the countryside near my home in Uze. And with the famous Pont du Gard aqueduct winking in the distance, I brought my culinary students on a field trip. We're at Les Domaines de la Classe with boutique winemaker Frédéric David. His is typical Rhone country with varying terroir. White calcium laden soils and red pebbles washed down from the Alps. There's nothing new world about Frédéric and his father Alain's approach to this age-old craft. However, their wines are geared to a growing international market. They're organic, and around 20% of the harvest is made into kosher wine and exported to places like Israel, Toronto, and New York. Same thing for And now, that should be good and organic, or organic and good. Same thing for kosher. So a French vintner making kosher wine. How so? Well, it's all about exploiting a gap in a niche market too often besieged with bad quality. All the manipulation must be done by the rabbi or a delegate of the rabbi. So that means that I'm, in fact, the wine director. I choose which vines, which grapes I put into the vat. Everything must be done by the rabbi. If I touch it, you know, as I'm not religious, or if a non-religious, uh, uh, if an, uh, someone who's not Jewish touch it, all the vat can be uh, dequalified, can, it can be not kosher. It will be wine, but it won't be used by religious people. While I can't vouch for the religious fervor of any of my gastronomers, they're devoutly enjoying the wine. And the 2009 kosher Le Mort de Lille is certainly worth crossing spiritual boundaries for. French markets are bursting at the seams with seasonal produce, even during the late summer months. My market in Uzez is one of the best. I have to control myself in case I go completely mad and buy far too much. This is the time of year to indulge. This is a real tomato, you know, ugly, uneven, smells like heaven. The uglier tomato is probably the better it tastes. And of course, this is all organic. The Southern French are masters of preservation. <gasps> Duck. Donkey. Cured meats or saucisson are always on the shopping list. You see all this white penicillin that's on the outside? That's good. That's what you want. And you don't need to put these in the fridge when you get home. You just hang them up and keep them nice and dry. OK, yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite stall holders sells preserved fruit paste and wine. And in this case, it comes especially blessed. This is Sister Ambrosia, who uh, comes from a Greek Orthodox convent. And the nuns make wine. Dans le monastère, nous sommes 15 auteurs. Il y a 7 nationalités. In the monastery, there are 15 sisters and 7 nationalities. And they, um, they've got big kitchens where they make all this stuff, and they've got vineyards where they make wine as well. <laughs> and I seldom depart without saying bonjour to my friend, Cécile, local escargot vendor. These mollusky morsels are last year's snails. This year's harvest is still hiding under the board. But not for much longer, with the festive season approaching. During the harvest time, Cyril's weekends are full-on family affairs. 
All the rallies are called upon and let loose brandishing gloves and buckets. It's the end of the shady summer days for cereal snails. 280,000 of them. Christmas dinner parties are on the way and he'll spend the month of November removing shells and intestines, cooking the snails in bouillon and then popping them back into the shells dressed with garlic and butter. Uh -oh. During the day, the snails stay here mm -hmm. and after I put the water at 9 o'clock, they go out and they go to eat. You know, I make food for snails here. It's a cereal, uh, like a blé, orange and maïs. And I put uh, some grass, like that, that is a uh, grass. Cyril couldn't achieve the harvest without family help. Escargo are labour intensive from go to work. But at 42 euros a processed kilo, it's a worthwhile venture. the summer's bounty at my culinary school. The late summer sun is beaming on my week of southern French culinary classes. But basking by the pool at Mas Dool takes second fiddle to the height of activity in the kitchen. On the menu, a flat tomato tart, a delicious starter for tonight's dinner, and on the side, a very Moorish tomato jam. In the south of France, chef some chefs give whole cooking classes that last a week on only tomatoes. So this is a flat tart. This is another flat tart that doesn't have borders. There's the vasa. Yes, stick it all out on the bench. Making your own pastry is a diversion. And some people just need a little coaxing in order to get on with it. But I figure I get true converts in the end. Because when done properly, it is so rewarding. So you're just getting all that stuff in. You might, I might put a little bit more cold water in for you. So, in the meantime, somebody can be chopping tomatoes. I don't know where the world would be without tomatoes. Just like to say that. They are endlessly versatile and they adore being slow cooked. Here we go, Maria. Who would like to roll out the other piece of pastry? Oh, oh you wanted to, didn't you? Yeah. That might, it could go a little bit further probably. But the good good thing I was told woe by these girls. Oh yeah, they're all in now. We won't listen to them. Um, it's sisters and pastry making. And any other topic of the day. And all talking at once. It's like trying to teach a class in a bird cage. <laughs> So what goes on top, this is the most beautiful tart, what goes on top of the pastry which is just resting in the fridge is um, a little mixture of goat cheese and parmesan. What I also have today is a flavoursome basil pesto, but you could just mix fresh basil leaves in with the cheese. I'm probably going to go home and say I'm never cooking again. <laughs> <laughs> So just a little bit of cheese, because it's not a cheese tart. The key to the success of this tart is the type of tomato you use. They really need to be very fleshy, so the pastry doesn't get soaked with the juice. Acid-free romas are perfect. The other most important thing is abundance. Lots of tomato slices layered snugly in a gorgeous swirl. Now what's going to happen is the tomatoes will contract and gently caramelize. The tart goes in the oven at 200 degrees for 30 minutes and then the temperatures decrease to just 150 degrees for a further 45 minutes. And while this cooking time seems long, it is necessary to dry out the tomatoes and make them extra tasty. And with the scent of roasting tomatoes wafting from the kitchen door, it's time for drinks as the sun sinks slowly in the west. As late summer rays caress the rolling Isère's landscape, you can be sure the grape pickers all over the south of France are up with the birds. This harvest really is a family and friends affair. Love, not money, is motivating these busy hands. 
pitching in, mum and dad included, to help an American lass with her romantic French wine venture. The Languedoc, where we are, is the biggest grape growing region in the whole of France. In fact, when you look at maps of the Languedoc, they have signs all over them for vineyards. This is where you grow vines, this is where you grow vines. Well, you can't see anything else because that's all there is. There's just millions of signs for vineyards. And it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm here at my friend Amy's vineyard in Castillon du Gard. And her and her friends and family, who she's dragged out of bed, are picking grapes. Okay, this is um, Grenache that we're going to pick, Peter. Yeah. And it's, um... It's no, you know, no, no, I'm a virgin. Oh, oh, right, right. Sorry, okay, so okay. I have instruments. It's hard to see, so what you're going to do is come over here and just clip like this. And then... You want to taste it? Oh, the best part about picking grapes is tasting how good that is. Are there ever any left by the end? Mm, yeah, because actually by the end you get sick of tasting. Oh, God. Isn't that amazing? I think this is wonderfully rustic. My friend Amy Lillard here, all the way from Colorado Springs, however, knows it's all about hard work. Everybody heard about Amy and Uzez. The word went around that there was this American girl thinking that she could make wine. <laughs> <laughs> and this, I mean, this is staunch, man. This is old. This is one of the oldest provinces in France. How did they react to you? I think woman? they thought it was kind of amusing, really. Yes, to start with. Yes. That's yes, what happened to me yes. in Paris when yes. I opened my restaurant. Right, they thought... Oh, what a joke. Yeah, exactly. They thought, oh, look at this girl. She had a big straw hat on driving a 1963 Matthew Ferguson tractor. And so... <laughs> but now they, they take you very seriously. Well, they see that we've stuck with it. They see that we do all the work. It's Matt and I. We don't have any employees. You can see around us. These are all our friends These and family. These people are not being paid. Yeah. I'm not being paid. <laughs> Amy produces her wine under the moniker La Crenière, and the commitment is to making biodynamic, hand-picked wines using only traditional Côte de Rhône grape varieties. But overall, when you look around in this beautiful setting and, and, and when you pick the grapes with your friends and family, it's yeah. such a rewarding thing. And when you put a bottle of wine on the table and it's, you made it, yeah. there's nothing more amazing than that. Yeah. And so, to Domaine de la Gramière, in the village of Saint-Quentin de la Poterie. The scene for this year's harvest party, where there's never any shortage of wine, it's also Amy and her husband Matt's home. It takes a certain amount of naivete to do what we did. It's like jumping into a stream, like the stream just takes you. So you just, you just jump in and you just do it. You don't really understand what it means until you're fully... Drowning in the stream. <laughs> <laughs> but with an export line home to the United States, and not to mention rave reviews, there's mileage yet in being a real French vigneron. Now you may remember the shopping expedition to my favourite Uzes Boucherie to buy all the meat for the culinary week's lessons and dinner parties. On that shopping list was duck legs, bred especially for their fat. You see, in New Zealand you would go to prison for serving duck leg that had that much fat on it. But there are two kinds of duck leg that you buy, and the one to make it confit, or um, preserved duck leg, has to have a lot of fat on it, because the fat creates the liquid in which you're going to cook it. The kitchen at Mars des will have seen a few duck confits, as it used to be a working farm. Duck confit normally is prepared in the summer and put down for the winter, so it's real heartwarming food. This is a very old recipe, originating in the southwest of France. We're still actually a step behind the times here because confit de canard must be prepared in stages. The legs must first be cured and marinated with salt, garlic, herbs and pepper. And you can't skip this stage because the salt increases the confit's shelf life and removes fluid. The legs are then put in the fridge to marinate overnight. 24 hours have gone by. The marinade on the duck legs has been washed off and they have been cooking very, very gently in duck fat, completely covered for two hours at this point. But they may need a little bit longer 
because the recipe is for six and this is this is a lot of duck legs in here so i'm just going to have a look at one you can see by the um bubbles that it's just like barely 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 a simmer you wouldn't even call it a simmer it's more like a caress the, the duck legs sit in there and, and the duck fat caresses them for at least two hours but i can tell just by touching this it should be completely falling apart that it's not cooked enough yet so i'm going to put it in for another half hour Okay, these are now cooked, and so you drain them on trays. If you're going to preserve them and keep them and not eat them immediately, you, um, you leave them in the fat and you preserve them that way, either in your basement or in your fridge. Um, if you're going to cook them, uh, if you're going to grill them immediately, you lay them on trays like this, let um, the fat drip off and then stick it under the grill because all you're doing with the grill is making the um, skin crispy. Duck fat ensures that you keep all your curves because the last thing you want to do is lose your curves. That's it for that stage. We're going to serve our, our tomato tart and our tomato jam. This is Sasa. We've got two handsome young men as guests. And then we're going to quickly grill the duck legs to make the skin go crispy. David um, and Susie are sauteing potatoes, and we've got a green salad, just in case there's any weird people who feel that they need lettuce. So yes, our starter is finally yeah, ready. Yeah. Slow baked to perfection. The flat tomato tart looks and smells like heaven. Well, yeah, two, uh, I'm serving it with a tomato jam, another gift of summer goodness, flavoured with honey, cinnamon and orange blossom water. That's the starter. Here's the main. These are done and they call pommes de terre salad which is uh, basically potatoes cooked in the same duck or goose fat as the duck. Uh, and the traditional recipe is to put them in slices, salt them, dry them off, put them in the, mix them with the fat, let them take on the bottom and then turn them over until they all get all crispy. Find a different way of doing it, which is to do them in tubes like this. Put in a little bit of um, French or cheese. This is the entire video. And at the end, last two or three minutes of cooking, a handful of chopped up parsley and a handful of chopped up garlic. You've got to half a peck of condiment to add coffee to that. Thankfully, coffee de canard takes so long to prepare and cook. This is special occasion food with a capital F for fat. Delicious food for the soul and thighs. As expected, the meat is falling from the bone and my culinary students are happily dreaming of a time when they'll repeat the performance in their own kitchen. Join me next time for one last adventure in the south of France. The walled medieval town of Aigamont is the scene for endless salt flats, fiery flamenco dancers, dusky Arlesian maidens, Rydham cowboys, gypsies, and steaming mussels. I slurp up fabulous olive oil and a grand finale starring a wild chef. <laughs>